Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India everyone welcome to the ninth lecture of our course ADR and arbitration this lecture is again on appointment of arbitrators as I said in the previous session that the topic of appointment of arbitrator has been divided into two parts we saw some developments in relation to this topic in our previous session and I said that this is one provision which has undergone changes at various times these changes have been done by the orders passed by the courts these changes have been done by the amendments done in 2015 2019 so we are following the the process the way the provision has been modified we said starting from 1996 it continued as an administrative order. The Chief Justice used to pass administrative orders. Then came SBP company case in which Supreme Court declared that the decision passed by Chief Justice shall be judicial in nature and the other party will be invited to contest. The Chief Justice must answer certain preliminary questions before, before appointing an arbitrator. And then came the amendment of 2015 in which the responsibility of appointing arbitrator in cases of default is given to the Supreme Court or High Court as the case may be in place of Chief Justice of India or Chief Justice of the respective High Court. Now if you recall we were trying to understand the interpretation of uh, the provision which came in 2015. We said there are few changes which have happened section 116A came into existence, 116B came into existence. And there was one change that Chief Justice will not exercise the power. Now the power will be exercised by the Supreme Court or the respective High Court. Section 6A also says that now while appointing an arbitrator, the Supreme Court or the High Court will have to limit the investigation only to the prima facie existence of the arbitration agreement. The changes were done in section 8 also we tried to compare 8 with 11 and said that in section 8 the judicial authority will examine prima facie validity of the agreement whereas in section 11 the, the Supreme Court will only see prima facie existence of the agreement. What does that mean? We saw it in the case of Duro Felguera versus Gangavaram Port Limited in which Supreme Court appointed 5 arbitral tribunals although the opposite party was requesting to appoint only one on the ground that five contracts have emanated from the same tender document but court said no we will appoint as many tribunals as many arbitration agreements exist. So they only saw existence of arbitration agreement nothing more but that was not end very next year we got another case Hyundai engineering case. And the point which was laid down in that case again disturbs the understanding of section 11. The meaning of section 11 6a as contemplated by legislature undergoes a change again in the Hyundai engineering case. Because Supreme Court says that we cannot straight away go and appoint arbitrator by merely looking at existence of an arbitration agreement. No, that is not sufficient. Some limited interpretation of the arbitration agreement has to be done. Some limited interpretation of the arbitration agreement has to be done so as to see whether there is a dispute to be arbitrated. As it happened in that case, there was an argument that the matter is arbitrable only when the claim is admitted by the insurance company. Since insurance company in that case refused the claim, did not admit the claim, there is no question of any arbitration happening between the two parties. But this could be examined only when the Supreme Court or any court goes beyond mere existence of arbitration agreement. Court says we are not overruling Duro Felguera. We still believe that is a good law. But then Duro Felguera is a general observation regarding section 116A. 
and case in hand in Hyundai engineering was a specific case. Further, they said Duro Filgura cannot be binding on us because it is an opinion expressed by a smaller bench, whereas we are a larger bench. And therefore, finally, court holds that it will not be limited, the examination will not be limited to examining the prima facie existence of the agreement. Some limited interpretation of the agreement has to be done. So, we will have to go beyond existence, question of existence to see whether there are uh, matter which are arbitrable or not, whether there is an agreement which is valid or not. So, I said that this is not according to the essence of section 116A because parliament categorically says in 116A that notwithstanding any judgment, any order of any court, whenever Supreme Court or High Court has to appoint arbitrator, the court has to only see if there exists an agreement or not. So therefore, what I concluded in the last class, I said the Hyundai engineering case is not in accordance with the true spirit of section 116A. Now with that background, let's see what further continued. I said the problem regarding interpretation of section 116A continued even beyond Hyundai engineering. The legislative intent to allow the court to confine to the examination of the existence of an arbitration agreement for the purpose of exercise of power under the provision remains unsettled even today. I will take you back again here. The problem regarding interpretation of section 116A continued. The legislative intent to allow the court to confine to the examination of the existence of an arbitration agreement for the purpose of exercise of power under the provision remains settled even today. Now here I will take you back for a moment. If you remember, I said 2015 amendment was notified and the provision continued, then came 2019 amendment. But I said that 2019 amendment to section 11 has not been notified so far. So since it has not been notified so far, the law still is the unamended provision which came in 2015. That is why we are emphasizing on the provision of 2015. And as I said, the problem started, uh, there was an interpretation given by the Supreme Court in Duro Felguera, then interpretation changed in Hyundai Engineering and now when I am saying the interpretation is continuously changing even today. And the issue related to section 116A is not settled even today because in 2017, Duro Felguera came, 2018, Hyundai Engineering came. In 2019, there is another case called as Mayavati Trading versus Pradyut Dev Burman. Now, in Mayavati Trading versus Pradyut Dev Burman, uh, 2019 Supreme Court case, here Supreme Court overruled the judgment in United India Insurance, the Hyundai Engineering case. So, Duro Felguera was not followed in United India Insurance case. And United India Insurance case is overruled in Mayavati Trading versus Pradyut De Burman. Court stated that the judgment does not lay down the correct law. And court reaffirmed that section 116A is confined to the examination of the existence of an arbitration agreement and is to be understood in a narrow sense as has been laid down in the case of Duro Felguera. Now you can see the judicial flip-flop. In Duro Felguera, Supreme Court said we will only see the existence, prima facie existence of the agreement. Then United India Insurance, the Hyundai engineering case in which Supreme Court says that no, we will go beyond prima facie ex existence and examine the validity, examine other questions which are involved, see whether the matter is an exempted matter or whether it is arbitrable. Then comes Mayavati trading which says no. The law laid down in, in, in United India Insurance is not a good law. You should not go beyond mere existence because Parliament has categorically said so in Section 11, 6A. Therefore, in, in Mayavati Trading, Supreme Court says that the law laid down in Duro Felguera is the correct law. This happened in 2019. Again, in 2019 itself, another case comes. Now, this case is Garware Wall Ropes Limited, Garware Wall Ropes Limited versus Coastal Marine Constructions and Engineering Limited, Coastal Marine Constructions and Engineering Limited 2019 Supreme Court cases. Now, here 
there is an issue that arbitration clause is part of a contract and that contract was not sufficiently stamped. There was deficiency in relation to stamp, stamp duty. So, there is a contract which contains the arbitration clause and the contract is not sufficiently stamped. Now, when a question of appointment of arbitrator came, when an application under section 11 of the act was filed, Supreme Court did not decide, did not appoint the arbitrator on the ground that the arbitration clause is not sufficiently stamped. The Supreme Court declined to appoint arbitrator on the ground that the arbitration agreement is not sufficiently stamped. Now, provision says you only have to see prima facie existence of the agreement. When you see existence, you do not examine anything. How did you come to this conclusion that the, the agreement is not properly stamped? Probably you must have examined it thoroughly to see whether it is properly stamped or not. So, therefore, by the fact that the Supreme Court comes to the conclusion that we are not going to appoint arbitrator because the, the agreement itself is unstamped or not properly stamped means that the court is going beyond the question of prima facie existence of the agreement. That means we are going back to judgment of United India Insurance. So, from Duro Felguera, the law changes, United India Insurance, again we go back in Mayavati trading to the judgment of Juro Felguera and now again in Garvari wall ropes, we go back to United uh, India Insurance. So, that is how law is changing, the judicial flip-flop. You can say prima facie existence, we will interpret it. Prima facie existence, we will interpret it. That is how the law is changing and therefore, in the first point, if you see, I have written that the legislative intent to allow the court to confine its investigation only to prima facie existence of the agreement, this question is still not settled even today. But that is not all. You see, in 2023, Supreme Court three judges bench decides a question. Three judges bench got a case. The case is called Messrs. NN Global Mercantile Private Limited, Messrs. NN Global Mercantile Private Limited versus Messrs. Indo Unique Flame Limited and others, 2023 Supreme Court. The matter was listed before a three judges bench and the three judges bench doubted the correctness of the decision in Garware Wall Ropes, the case which I just mentioned. Garware Wall Ropes is the judgment in which arbitrator was not appointed on the ground that the arbitration agreement is not sufficiently stamped. The arbitration agreement is not sufficiently stamped, therefore we are not going to appoint arbitrator for you. That means Supreme Court went beyond mere existence, went beyond examining mere existence. Now in NN Global Mercantile Private Limited, the three judges bench expressed doubt on the correctness of the judgment in Garvare Wall Ropes and therefore the matter was referred to a larger bench of five judges. Now majority of that bench. The case was finally decided in April by a majority of 3 to 2 and the majority held that an arbitration agreement within the meaning of section 7 of the act which attracts stamp duty cannot be acted upon unless the payment of requisite duty is made. So, the point is very clear. The bench said, the majority said that the arbitration agreement which is unstamped or understamped cannot be relied upon. The court while dealing with section 11 must not shirk its duty under Stamp Act. Now they are going into the details of Stamp Act and saying that Stamp Act is a physical law. It is a fiscal law and fiscal law cannot be avoided, ignored in the name of giving effect to section 11. What I am trying to say is in order to protect some stamp act, some fiscal law, court in this case diluted the scope of section 116A, modified the scope of section 116A. They are saying that we are not going to rely on an arbitration agreement which is understamped or unstamped. Such an arbitration agreement cannot be relied upon and if an application under section 11 is filed with a request to appoint an arbitrator. An arbitrator cannot be appointed. Why? Because the agreement is understamped. Now, this is again the same situation which we saw in Garvare Wall Ropes. 
where the Supreme Court says that we will not limit ourselves to examination of prima facie existence. We will go beyond that question and see whether the agreement in question is a reliable document or not. This was the judgment of majority. But minority opinion was different because as I said, the case was decided by a majority of three is to two. So two judges dissented and these two judges were of the opinion that issue of stamping is not a very serious issue. Issue of deficiency in stamping, lack of stamp or understamp, this is not a defect which cannot be cured. It can be cured always. The parties can be asked to go back, pay stamp duty and then come for the proceedings. It is always possible. It is a curable defect. So when the defect is curable, court must not be very harsh and start deviating from the legislative intent which is, which is quite visible in section 116a. They said instead of refusing to appoint arbitrator on the ground that, this, that the document is understamped, a better idea would have been to refer the matter for arbitration, appoint arbitrators, let the parties go to the tribunal and let this question of understamping of agreement be raised before the tribunal because tribunal should be the body which must decide these questions. Tribunal should be the body which must decide the question of validity of the arbitration agreement. I have mentioned it in past also while discussing section 8 that the that section 16 incorporates the principle of competence, competence and the provision gives power to the tribunal to first of all decide validity. No other body must decide the validity of an agreement unless tribunal has done it. So therefore, the majority judgment has the potential to distort the scope of section 116a. Not only that, majority judgment also has the potential to disturb the scope of section 16 which if you recall I said after the amendment of 2015 was restored because prior to 2015 amendment the question of validity was in any case determined by Chief Justice under section 11 because of 2015 amendment this question was taken away the Supreme Court will not decide as per section 116a and therefore I concluded that the scope of section 16 got restored. But now again, after these judgments, Garware Ropes, United India Insurance and now NN Global, it has become very clear that Supreme Court, High Court, these courts are not going to limit the investigation only to the issue of existence of agreement. They will definitely travel beyond this question and go into the issue of determining validity of arbitration agreement. Now recently what has happened, recently the Supreme Court has referred this case NN Global Mercantile Private Limited, the April judgment of five judges bench. That judgment has been referred to a larger bench of seven judges to examine the correctness of the verdict of five judges bench. So we can expect that very soon there will be a verdict of seven judges bench on this question which relates to Stamp Act on one hand which is a fiscal law I've already said and section 116A of Arbitration Conciliation Act. And, and let's hope that that judgment will clarify the doubts related to section 116a. So what we can conclude is that the judicial flip-flop in relation to power of Supreme Court, power of High Court or scope of duty of High Court, Supreme Court under section 11, that aspect is still not clear. The judicial opinion is continuously changing. It is still in the fluid state. And no one can say with clarity as to what is going to, going to happen in the seven judges bench in relation to NN Global Mercantile Private Limited. Now, this is the background of 2019 amendment. We have understood that court is not going to limit it to what legislature says in 116A. So therefore, I, a high powered committee was constituted by the government to propose mechanisms so as to promote uh, uh, institutional arbitration in India. A high level committee was appointed as I said to review the institutionalization of arbitration mechanism in India. What can be done to institutionalize or to promote institutional arbitrations in India because I have mentioned in the beginning in initial lectures that 
that you can classify arbitration into domestic arbitration, institutional arbitration. In Indian situation, most of the arbitrations are domestic arbitrations. Government wants to promote institutional arbitration. Let's do our arbitrations according to rules of some institution where arbitrators are to be appointed by some institutions. Institutional arbitrations do not lead to many litigations. That is the, that is the assumption. Therefore, in order to propose means so as to promote institutional arbitration, this high-level committee was appointed. The committee gave its report. And out of various recommendations made by this committee, one recommendation is to amend Section 11 of Arbitration Conciliation Act. Because we have realized that as long as you leave it with the courts, there will always be problem of increasing judicial intervention at such a preliminary stage of arbitration. Because appointment of arbitrator is absolutely a preliminary stage. And if everything gets delayed because of judicial intervention, the purpose of arbitration gets frustrated. So therefore, the high level committee recommended amendment in section 11. And you can see, in order to ensure speedy appointment of arbitrators, this is the recommendation of high level committee. In order to ensure speedy appointment of arbitrators, section 11 may be amended to provide that the appointment of arbitrators under the section shall only be done by arbitral institutions. So now, appointment shall not be done by the Chief Justice. Appointment shall not be done by the Supreme Court, High Court. Now, appointment shall be done by arbitral institutions. So if there is a problem in relation to appointment of arbitrator, don't go to Supreme Court, go to an arbitral institution. But which arbitral institution is, is allowed? That's a question. So, the recommendation says appointment of arbitrator under section 11 shall be made by arbitral institutions which are designated by the Supreme Court. So, Supreme Court will not make appointment. Supreme Court will designate an arbitral institution and that arbitral institution will make an appointment. This in the case of international commercial arbitration and in case of any other arbitration other than international commercial arbitration you will have to approach an arbitral institution which is designated by the respective high court. So therefore, now the role of Supreme Court and high court is not to appoint arbitrators, but to designate arbitral institutions. So the problem that Supreme Court is always going beyond prima facie existence and starts examining the validity, that aspect is no, will no more remain relevant once this amendment is notified. Then the committee also recommends that the institution which may act as appointing authority under section 11 may be designated by the Supreme Court High Court and only those institutions which have been graded by a body called as Arbitration Council of India. So there will be a body created under this act. That body will grade arbitral institutions. Out of those graded arbitral institutions, some institutions will be designated by the Supreme Court and High Court to be the institution with appointing authority, arbitrator appointment authority. And this grading shall be done by the Arbitration Council of India on the basis of certain criteria. And out of all the graded arbitral institutions, the institution with higher grades, of course, will be designated by the Supreme Court and High Court. And that designated institution will make appointment of arbitrators. Now, the committee realized that the whole mechanism requires time for its implementation because in order to have such a mechanism, we will have to have, first of all, the Arbitration Council of India. An Arbitration Council of India can be established only once we come out with the regulations in relation to their appointment and other things, powers, termination, salary, etc. So once regulations are made, once the Arbitration Council of India is established, once the ACI Arbitration Council of India uh, completes the grading process and once the Supreme Court High Court identifies or designates few of those graded arbitral institutions as designated institutions, once all these are done, then only you can think about notifying the provision. So till that time, the present law which we discussed in the last class in, the, in, in this class also, till that time this law continues to be the law and the law is going to change once the new section 11 is notified 
and in order to notify new section 11 we will have to notify a new part in our act called as part 1a in the arbitration conciliation act so this is the recommendation of high level committee and in order to incorporate this recommendation we modified section 11 and we introduced a new subsection section 3a what it says subsection 3a in section 11 says that the supreme court and the high court shall have the power to designate arbitral institutions from time to time which have been graded by the council under section 43i for the purposes of this act so the proposal finds place in subsection 3a there is arbitration council of india according to part 1a that will be established arbitration council of india will do the grading of various arbitral institutions according to the criteria mentioned in section 43i we will talk about the criteria also later on and on the basis of that criteria it some grading of arbitral institutions will be done out of those graded institutions supreme court high court will have to designate some arbitral institutions and all the appointments shall be done by arbitral institutions the idea is to remove courts from this business the idea is to involve institutions so that indirectly institutional arbitration is promoted once you approach an institution with a request to appoint an arbitrator you see the performance of that institution you may feel like going to, to that institution for your arbitration that is how indirectly this is an attempt to promote institutional arbitration in india subsection 3a has a proviso it's a very realistic point which you have in proviso provided that in respect of those high court jurisdictions where no graded arbitral institutions are available it can happen in many states as of now because most of the arbitral institutions are located in delhi bombay some important places but you don't have arbitral institutions in many of the states in india now now what will happen there if there are no arbitral institutions what will be graded and if there are no graded arbitral institutions what will be designated so that situation has been mentioned in the proviso provided that in respect of those high court jurisdictions where no graded arbitral institutions are available then the chief justice of the concerned high court may maintain a panel of arbitrators for discharging the functions and duties of arbitral institutions so if you do not have arbitral institution it is the responsibility of chief justice of the concerned high court to have a panel of arbitrators and that panel of arbitrators will perform the role of arbitral institution so therefore in those states if you have to file an application for appointment of arbitrator you will have to request that panel of arbitrator which is maintained by the chief justice of the concerned high court that is the law so the appointment process has undergone a change now appointment will not be done by supreme court high court appointment will be done by arbitral institutions the arbitral institution must be a graded institution grading shall be done by the arbitration council of india according to criteria mentioned in section 43 43i and out of these graded institutions some will be designated these designated institutions will make appointment and in those places where you do not have arbitral institutions the chief justice will maintain a panel of arbitrators who, who will discharge the function of arbitral institution this is one change the second change is subsection 6a is omitted subsection 6a is omitted means what 6a provided that prior to 2019 amendment the law which still continues kindly recall i said 6a says that while appointing the arbitrator supreme court and the high court will have to confine its inquiry to prima facie existence of the arbitration agreement that is what we said there now 6a is omitted why because now supreme court high court don't have to do it so why to talk about a provision which says when supreme court appoints an arbitrator it should do according to this method because now courts are not doing it so 6a has been omitted subsection 7 is also omitted subsection 7 which attaches finality to the order has been omitted subsection 7 prior to 2019 amendment said that no order under section 11 4 11 5 11 6 can be challenged in appeal there is no appeal now if there is no appeal 
if no appointment is going to be made by the courts, therefore the question of appeal also goes. So these are the changes which have been done in Section 11. Now what I want to highlight is, as, as I mentioned under the, the provision prior to amendment under subsection 7, it was written that the decision of Supreme Court or High Court shall be final and no appeal shall lie against the decision including letter patent appeal. Even LPA shall not apply. What is LPA? It is an appeal from a single judge of High Court to a division bench of High Court. Letters patent appeal is a mechanism of appeal within the same court when you file an appeal from a decision of one judge to a bench of two judges. That is a division bench. So, no appeal shall lie against the decision of Supreme Court or High Court. The orders are final. The order of appointment is final. And if the order of appointment also comes along with the order as regards validity of arbitration agreement, that is final. No appeal. Now, that provision has been dropped. Now, the confusion which emerges is, as long as it was done by the Supreme Court, High Court, we were very clear that there will not be any appeal. Do we want to say that even today, when it is not done by Supreme Court or High Court, when it is going to be done by a designated arbitral institution, even that decision is going to be final? Try and understand my point. When we are going to implement the amendment, then institutions will make appointment, arbitral institutions will make appointment. Will that order be also final? And if that order is not final, where will we go in appeal against the decision of the arbitral institution? Because if you do not have a provision which says whether it is final or not, what will we, we assume? As long as we had subsection 7, we knew that the decision of Supreme Court, the decision of High Court is final. Now the decision will be taken by arbitral institution and subsection 7 is not there. There is no provision which will say whether the decision taken by arbitral institution is final or not. If it is not final, where should I file my appeal? This is one area which has to be identified, which has to be, which has to be addressed. Similarly, when I said subsection 6a has been omitted, has been dropped, try to understand subsection 6a provided a mechanism, a procedure to be followed by the Supreme Court, High Court. Now the procedure has changed. Appointment shall not be made by Supreme Court High Court. It shall be made by a designated arbitral institution. When they were doing it, they had to do according to 6A. When the institution has to do it, what is the procedure the institution will follow? That is missing now. When we gave it to the Supreme Court High Court, we said you do according to 6A. When we are giving it to designated institution, we are not telling them how to do it. We are not telling as to what shall be the scope of investigation to be done by the arbitral institutions. Should they examine existence? Should they examine validity? Should they examine nothing? How should they finally come to the decision whether arbitrator has to be appointed or not? The mechanism, the procedure is missing now. So because of omission of 6a and omission of subsection 7, these two problems may come that we are unable to understand what procedure shall be followed by the designated arbitral institution while appointing arbitrator. What shall be the scope of inv investigation and examination which the designated arbitral institution do in the process of appointing the arbitrator? Nothing is there. And second problem is whether the decision taken by or order passed by the designated arbitral institution shall be final or whether it can be challenged in appeal. This question is not also clear. These two issues need to be clarified and we can hope that when regulations will be made, we will get some clarification on these points. There are few changes. For example, in subsection 13, you will go back and read subsection 13 of section 11. Presently, the unamended provision prior to 2019 amendment, the provision said that endeavor shall be made to dispose of an application, endeavor shall be made by the Supreme Court and the High Courts to dispose of the application within a period of 60 days or something like that from the date when the notice is served to the opposite party. So from the date notice is served to the opposite party, you have these many days within which you must try to dispose of the application. 
So it is not a mandatory requirement. It is just a persuasive kind of provision where the courts have been asked to make endeavor to ensure that they dispose of the application within these many days. Now that has been changed. The new subsection 13 will say that the matter shall be disposed of by the arbitral institution, the designated arbitral institution within a period of 30 days from the date of service of notice on the other party. It provides that the matter shall be disposed of by the arbitral institution within a period of 30 days. It does not say that the arbitral institution shall endeavor to dispose it of in 30 days. It says it shall be disposed of. So the language has become mandatory. So the language has become mandatory. Prior to 2019 amendment, it was not drafted in a mandatory language, but now it is mandatory. But does it really become mandatory? That is a question to be answered. Because what will happen if the designated arbitral institution does not dispose of the application in 30 days? Does it mean that the mandate given to designated arbitral institution terminate? So what shall be the consequences of non-observance of the requirements of subsection 13? What shall be the consequences if the designated arbitral institution does not comply with this timeline? Those consequences have not been mentioned. And a very simple understanding of statutory interpretation is that even if you draft a provision in mandatory language, but you don't provide the consequences of its breach, invariably courts are going to consider that provision to be a directory provision. You draft a provision in a mandatory language, but you don't provide for consequences of its breach. Then in most of the cases, invariably you will see courts will say that such provision, such provision which is drafted in mandatory language but which does not provide for consequences of its breach is not actually a mandatory provision. So even if we have changed the language, I think subsection 13 still remains non-mandatory. But yes, the change in language will definitely help in, in persuading the arbitral institutions to make their best effort to do it, dispose it of within 30 days. And why we have reduced the number of days, obviously we want to expedite the process. We want to set arbitration in motion as quickly as possible. Let's not devote too much time in resolving these preliminary issues because the substance of the matter is yet to be arbitrated. So these are some of the changes. Subsection 14 talks about payment of fees of arbitrators. Schedule 4 of the Arbitration Conciliation Act talks about payments Payments have to be made according to the Schedule 4. However, subsection 14 does not apply to international commercial arbitration. Some flexibility has been given to international commercial arbitration. They are not bound by the payment schedule, fee schedule, which is given in fourth schedule. Plus, this subsection will also not apply in cases of other domestic arbitrations where you are doing it with the help of some institution. So institutional arbitrations are exempted from application of fourth schedule. International commercial arbitrations are exempted from application of fourth schedule. So any ad hoc arbitration, for any ad hoc arbitration only, where the arbitrators are appointed under section 11, you have the application of fourth schedule for payment of fees. There are various other subsections in section 11. For example, subsection 8 says, whenever the Supreme Court or the High Court and now after amendment whenever a designated arbitral institution is asked to make appointment of arbitrator, the designated institution will ensure that an unbiased person is appointed as arbitrator. So therefore they may seek a declaration from the proposed person that there are no circumstances which may cast doubt on his independence or impartiality. So it is the responsibility of the arbitral institution to appoint that person who remains unbiased. It is the responsibility of arbitral institution to appoint a person who fulfills the qualification mentioned in the arbitration agreement. If because of any reason a party approaches two or more arbitral institutions with the same request, there may be five designated arbitral institutions in some state. I wrote to one, I wrote to second arbitral institution, I wrote to three arbitral institutions. Then in that case, which institution will make appointment? 
the arbitral institution which was requested for the first time will make the appointment of arbitrators. The remaining institutions will not make appointment of arbitrator. This is the mechanism. The main important thing, the most important thing is once section 11 is notified, the appointment shall be made by designated arbitral institutions. Subsection 6a has been dropped. Subsection 7 has been dropped. Some clarifications are required. The timeline has been reduced. The, the, the language of subsection 13 has been made mandatory, but as consequences are missing, it still remains directory. This is the new provision which will be notified and which will become operational once these are notified. Now we have come to part 1a of the act. As I just mentioned, that new section 11 shall be notified when an arbitration council of India will be established. Because Arbitration Council of India will have to grade institutions and only graded institutions are eligible to be designated as the designated arbitral institution. So the whole process seems to be taking some time. Part 1A of the Act talks about establishment of Arbitration Council of India. Section 43B Clause 1 says the central government shall by notification in the official gazette establish for the purposes of this Act a council to be known as Arbitration Council of India to perform the duties and discharge the functions under this act. So this council has to be established under 43B. It has not been done so far. Section 43 capital C provides the qualifications. It says the chairman of the council shall be a person who has been a judge of the Supreme Court or chief justice of a high court or a judge of a high court or an eminent person having special knowledge and experience in the conduct or administration of arbitration to be appointed by the central government in consultation with the Chief Justice of India. Why I am telling you the qualification? Because the qualification suggests that this is going to be an important institution. Because the chairman is going to be a person who has been a judge of Supreme Court or who has been a, a, the chief justice of high court or who has been the judge of some high court. And the appointment shall be made by the central government in consultation with the highest judicial authority of, of, of the country. Central government will make appointment in consultation with chief justice of India. Uh, any eminent person having special knowledge or expertise or experience in conducting the arbitration can also be made uh, the chairman of Arbitration Council of India. The council shall have two members, two ex officio members, one part time member and an ex officio member secretary. I will not go in detail of the qualification of these members. But one thing is very clear that we will have an Arbitration Council of India, that council will grade institutions. The graded institutions will apply for designation, the designated institutions will make appointment of arbitrator and the entire problem of judicial intervention at early stage of arbitration will be solved. That is the expectation from these provisions, it's in the new 11 and the new part 1a. The body is going to be established very soon as, as expected and the body will be chaired by a very senior person. As I mentioned, I gave you the qualification and the appointment shall be made by the central government in consultation with the Chief Justice of India. 43i was referred in section 113a also. Designation of arbitral institution, who is eligible? Only the graded arbitral inst institutions are eligible. 43i talks about general norms for grading of arbitral institutions. What are the norms for grading the arbitral institution? The council, it says, the council shall make grading of arbitral institutions on the basis of criteria. And what are the criteria? Criteria relating to infrastructure, quality and caliber of arbitrators. I don't know how do they decide quality and caliber of arbitrators. What is actually the meaning of infrastructure in this context is to be clarified. A lot has to be done on the basis of regulations which have to be framed. So, grading shall be done on the basis of criteria relating to infrastructure, criteria of quality and caliber of arbitrators, criteria of performance and compliance of time limits for disposal of domestic or international commercial arbitrations. 
these are the criteria in such manner as may be specified by the regulation so what is the manner in which you will be relying on these criteria these things will be clarified by the regulation some additional criteria may also be proposed indirectly as part of these criteria or these criteria may be explained what do we mean by infrastructure what do we mean by quality caliber of arbitrators performance of an arbitrator compliance of time limits in case of domestic arbitration and international commercial arbitration time limits are very important these have become very important nowadays when we enacted the law in the year 1996 we were not mindful of this aspect of time limit today after the amendment we see time limit in almost every provision every relevant place for example you have a new provision section 29a which prescribes that the arbitration has to be finished within a period of 12 months unless the period is extended by the parties or by a court 29b which talks about fast track arbitration says that the entire process must be disposed of in a matter of 6 months unless the time is extended so time limit is now becoming important and the performance of arbitrator the performance of arbitral institution in observing the time limits in complying with the time limits is one of the important criteria now my apprehension is if these are the criteria there may be issues with respect to new arbitral institution a new arbitral institution may not be able to get gradings because the new arbitral institution does not have results to show to to the arbitration council of india that we have done these many arbitrations we have followed the timeline in all these arbitrations we have uh, ensure these many awards remain unchallenged these awards could not be challenged all these are useful when i have been doing it for last many years so therefore this will create trouble for a new arbitral institution to get into the process of grading that is one observation now what high powered committee recommended the committee recommended that grading of arbitral institutions must not be mandatory don't just grade every institution which you have in that state don't grade every institution which we have in this country grading must not be mandatory grading must be voluntary now any voluntary thing must come with some incentive otherwise why will people come for grading so the high powered committee said that instead of making it a mandatory thing for all the institutions to apply for grading what we can do is we can incentivize the process of grading by arbitration council of india because we can say that only graded institution will be designated as it has been said in section 3a now so that one point is clear only the graded institution is eligible for designation non graded institutions are not eligible to be designated to appoint arbitrators under 113a this is one incentive the second incentive is we have discussed section 8 we have discussed section 45 power of judicial authority to refer the matter for arbitration when the judicial authority has to refer the matter for arbitration judicial authority will send the matter to only those arbitral institutions which are graded arbitral institutions this can be created this can be one of the incentives for the institutions to go for grading third we have discussed section 89 of cpc in which we said it is an opt out provision and if the judge thinks that there exists element of settlement judge will formulate the terms of settlement and will send parties to one of the modes of dispute resolution what are the modes of dispute resolution mentioned one of the modes is arbitration so whenever a judge under section 89 of cpc refers parties to arbitration according to arbitration conciliation act 1996 the judge under section 89 must refer it only to a graded institution another incentive so therefore what the high powered committee said that instead of making it mandatory let's make it optional let's make it voluntary and let's incentivize the process of grading let's give incentive to graded institutions and that is how more and more institutions will be interested to participate in the process of grading more and more institutions will get graded and therefore you will have more choices out of which you can identify or designate some institution 
for the purpose of appointment of arbitrator under section 113a the high powered committee said that the grading of institution must be made a transparent process as transparent as possible with the publication of the grading system and results on a public portal maintained by the arbitration council of india so let it be a transparent process let us publish the grading system on a public portal maintained by arbitration council of india let's publish the results of grading also on public portal but all these are not there in the act part 1a does not talk about all these so where do we have all these aspects probably you can hope that these aspects will be covered in the regulations which have to be framed so once regulations will be framed the basic provisions which i have mentioned for example 43i 43b 43c etc those aspects will be clarified arbitration council of india will be established and the process of grading and designation will start and then only we'll be in a position to notify the new section 11 some of the duties of the arbitration council of india once it is established it has the duty to recognize professional institutes which will provide accreditation of arbitrators institutions will be graded and arbitrators will be accredited now accreditation of arbitrators will be done by certain professional institutes and those professional institutes will be recognized by the arbitration council of india so institutions will be graded by aci and arbitration arbitrators accreditation will be done by recognized professional institutes and these institutes will be recognized by the arbitration council of india this is one of the duties of arbitration council of india second is that arbitration council of india will review the grading of arbitral institutions and arbitrators so the process of grading will be reviewed time to time and that will be the function of arbitration council of india one of our very important functions is to promote institutional arbitration by strengthening arbitral institutions so it is the responsibility of arbitration council of india to promote institutional arbitration in this country and for that purpose the arbitration council of india has to strengthen arbitral institutions fourth important function is to establish and maintain depository of arbitral awards made in india to establish and maintain depository of arbitral awards made in india i have identified some of the important functions you can look into part 1a to get the entire list they have to conduct workshops seminars do whatever to promote institutional arbitration in india few important ones have been identified here and one of the very important responsibilities given is to establish and maintain depository of arbitral awards made in india section 43k provides for establishment of depository of awards it says the council shall maintain an electronic depository of arbitral awards so there shall be an electronic depository of arbitral awards the council shall maintain an electronic depository of arbitral awards made in india all the awards which are passed in india will be deposited in that electronic depository and such other records related thereto in such manner as may be specified by the regulations so once regulations will be made we will start the process of establishing depository of all the awards so what what we want to achieve is there will be a depository electronic depository and all the awards passed in india will be deposited there so you can you can access any of the award but then there are certain missing links for example we can create the depository but the law must clarify who will have access to the depository law has not clarified who will have access to the depository second should the court only have access to the depository because what happens at times when you want to challenge an arbitral award it becomes at times difficult to get a copy of the arbitral award it is available in the depository court can get a copy directly from the depository that is a possibility high powered committee talked about these possibilities but the law does not say as to who will have access to the depository what is the purpose behind having a depository point number 1 2 how will you get the award in that depository who will file the award in that depository is it the responsibility of the parties 
Is it the responsibility of the tribunal, arbitral tribunal? That is again not clear. Third, in case of institutional arbitration, you can request the institution to file the award. But as I said, in India, most of the arbitrations are ad hoc arbitrations. How will you ensure that awards passed in ad hoc arbitration also filed with the depository? So therefore, there will always remain a difficulty in getting the awards filed so that it can be stored in the depository. That issue is not clear, but I hope regulations will clarify it. You can refer to section 43J, which talks about qualification and experience of arbitrators, accreditation of arbitrators on the basis of qualification and experience. 43J is related to 8th schedule of the Act. 8th schedule provides for qualification and experience of arbitrators. I will not go in detail of it because 8th schedule has now been omitted after 2021. 8th schedule provided qualifications. And if you read those qualifications, you will understand that a person from India can become the arbitrator because the qualification says advocate under Advocates Act, he, he should have experience in government department, he should be a, he should be a, if he, he is chartered accountant under Indian Act. So all the clauses only tell us that only an Indian can become an arbitrator. The qualification may ensure that only Indians become arbitrators. Now, this is against what we have studied in section 11. In the beginning itself, I said that a person of any nationality can be your arbitrator. So, if a person of any nationality can be your arbitrator, by way of 8th schedule, you are limiting it to only Indians. That means 8th schedule is not consistent with section 11. We understood it and we dropped the 8th schedule. There is problem with the experience of arbitrators part also. We will not go in detail of this because that has been dropped. So, what we have discussed is that the problem in relation to the present section 116A, which is still the law, the law which existed prior to 2019 amendment, it is in the state of flux, it is in a fluid state, the matter has been referred to a larger bench, let us hope that larger bench clarifies it or alternatively, we can also think to notify part 1A, create arbitration council of India get the grading, get the designation done so that the whole problem of judicial intervention is solved once for all. The next lecture shall be on grounds and procedure to challenge the arbitrators. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude, immoral, vulgar, and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare, as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. 
None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets.